before we start our episode today, this is just a reminder, History Hack does have a Patreon account and all of your donations are gratefully appreciated. There's lots of perks on there, secret groups on Facebook. Do get involved. We would love to see more of you. Enjoy the episode today. Hello and welcome to History Hack. We've got such an interesting guest for you today. Zach, who have we got with us? Well, today we are very lucky to have Lucy Adlington with us. Lucy is an author, presenter and clothing historian who's produced some great books on clothing history, including Fashion, Women in World War I and Stitches in Time, the story of the clothes we wear. We're going to be talking about her latest book, though, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, which is kind of every bit as fascinating and harrowing as it sounds. Lucy, it's fantastic to have you on. How are you doing? Uh, really good this morning. Really, really glad to be chatting with you. It seems a little inappropriate to be discussing such harrowing things on a very, very beautiful day today. I don't know if you have this reaction, Alex, but when you start thinking about this, it does produce a kind of physical reaction. It is like a physical physical repulsion, isn't it? I, what mm. interests me, Lucy, is that you get to cover fun stuff and clothes and the history of fashion and things like that. It's a story that needed to be told, but it's also to decide I'm going to... I mean, like, writing a book is like having a baby. You essentially put aside a section of your life where you concentrate on nothing else until you produce this thing at the end of it. Um, so you're going, you're knowing you're going to have to immerse yourself in the Holocaust... Um, how did you find it and how did you decide you wanted to write about it? Well, I think when when something grabs you, you don't actually have a choice. You know, it isn't actually a decision. And yes, this this concept that there is a fashion salon established in the most notorious death camp, Nazi death camp in Auschwitz, it is an extraordinary concept. And and I've got to say this project has been the most moving, most powerful most impactful thing I've ever worked on and I have worked on a fabulous range of projects you know covering spanning many many centuries of social history and I'm just I'm holding actually right now I've got the book um, the advanced copy of the book in print and I just I just it just hit me that this is a culmination of three decades of my life's work and I didn't start out um looking into Holocaust history so much, although that's something that's always intrigued me since I've been a child and first came across stories and just that outrage you feel that how is this happening? Why is this being done to innocent people? That was my childish view. And I actually, I don't think that's changed a great deal over the, over the years. And really to write about dressmaking in Auschwitz, it's been a coming together of lots of aspects of history that have always appealed to me. So the way clothes tell stories, and I'm really also interested in lifting stories out of obscurity, you know, giving people voices, amplifying voices and, and laying out the obscenities and injustices of the Holocaust. And you just talked now about that your very physical response to the subject. And um, yes, I have a dress in my collection that is from the Nazi era. And it, it is as close as coming to say that this dress is a Nazi dress, as you will get, um, not a uniform, an actual civilian dress. And I can talk a bit about that later. And it's a really, really pretty dress and fashion is really lovely. And yet when I look at this dress and know its history, I almost don't want to touch it. Mm. So how did, I, how did I come to write this particular aspect of history? Well, I was reading a very excellent scholarly book. It was an account of the fashion industry in the Third Reich and it mentioned a fashion salon. And there were just a, a few lists of names. There were nicknames. There was Bracha, Irene, Marta, Mimi, Manzi. And I'm thinking, who are these women? But as often happens with history, as I'm sure you find, I then got distracted by uh, many other projects. And that mention of a fashion salon in Auschwitz stayed in my mind. I, I, but you can say haunted. I think that's fair to say. And because I also write fiction, I write young adult fiction, it actually came out as a fictional story. I began sketching scenes and this became a young adult novel called The Red Ribbon with fictional characters and a semi-imagined setting of a fashion workshop in a slave labor camp. So not the real women from the camp about whom I knew almost nothing, but I wanted to think, what would it be like? What would it be like to sew for your oppressors? And in terms of the real history, I'd come to a dead end in research just these nicknames, how do you progress from there? And it was all very tantalizing, but I was going nowhere. And then, ironically, beautifully, the novel, The Red Ribbon, came to the attention of families of survivors. There was a review of it in Israel. 
and family members reached out and, and I, I got a slew of emails saying, oh, my aunt sewed for the commandant's wife in Auschwitz. You know, my mother sewed in that workshop. And then one saying, my grandmother ran that workshop. And can you even imagine how that felt for a historian to have names, full names is something, but then to have faces to those names because the holy grail isn't it photographs I, I actually it was overwhelming I began crying and so from there I could track down testimonies and eventually interview the last surviving seamstress of of this slave labor enterprise that's the short version <laughs> it took yeah. many years I'm I'm interested in just exploring for a moment that that physical reaction that that you mentioned a few moments ago because I, I sometimes wonder if if distance is part of what helps in that that process of processing it if you if you see what I mean and I'm thinking here about my personal experience and I speak to others who've been to Auschwitz um, and we all tend to have said the same thing when we discuss it that it's quite hard to compute whilst you're physically in the location where it all happened and it's only when you step away that you can kind of absorb everything do you have an equivalent with your work do you have to sort of re work as a historian and then take time to pause and process the emotional aspect before kind of going back into the historical you can try and compartmentalize and i think you have to and having spent so many years with reading about and analyzing such trauma you have to put it into boxes but then every once in a while at three in the morning i would just think oh my god this is real every single line I have written I mean it, it is all based on on evidence on objects on testimonies and so on I, it, this is not a novelization and so that realization that I am crafting a paragraph about such and such terrifying situation think I think bloody hell that is real that actually happened and of course then you transpose it and you think about on your own family you know what if that was my sister I was watching that happen to or my mother or or whatever and I think in terms of going to Auschwitz I, I found it really difficult to approach and I, I remember going, I was being on the the transfer from Krakow and I had my nails in my palms and I, I said to, to my partner who I was traveling with, I said, I, you know, I don't know how I don't know how I can do this because I'm carrying all of this knowledge, this research. And then I saw the the chimneys of Ego Farben, the, the big um, the big industrial plant from Auschwitz three. And I, again, I, well, I swore, you know, what what can you say? It's real. And when we actually arrived and I, I'm looking over the, the brick barracks where where the dressmakers were first housed on arrival and then you look out over the 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 grasslands that are now Birkenau and I, it, it's just impossible the disconnect to stand on the railway siding I mean we could we could discuss this we could discuss this for hours the physicality so what I would say it, is there's I one coming back to the words of the dressmakers themselves and that sort of grounded me I think one there's one thing that always strikes me is that there's everyone will have one thing they saw that tipped them over the edge. Mine was a cheese grater. Mine was in so it was literally um, in a glass case all on yeah. its own, and that is um, a woman who was being taken out of her home and sent to this place packed a cheese grater because she thought she might have use for it where she was going, and knowing where she was going and knowing. She was never going to need a cheese grater. That was what broke me. I think everyone has a, a particular reaction that pushes them to the edge when they go there. And whether it's sort of the pile of shoes or the sight of the barracks and the vastness of Birkenau. I, but that was mine was the cheese grater. And yet I would I would add on to that then and say what I found um, an extra layer of horror in researching this book about the dressmakers of Auschwitz is that somebody did use that cheese grater because the SS were absolutely ready to plunder. I mean, we're sort of getting ahead of ourselves here. When I was looking around auschwitz birkenau the State Museum exhibition, of course, I go straight to the clothes because the clothes always tell stories. And uh, yeah, seeing the clothes that everybody packed. And in many ways, it does seem the most grotesque contrast that you have the horror and finality of genocide that is physically represented by the space of the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex now. And then you have this ephemeral beauty and glamour of a fashion salon. And the building where the salon was housed is still, it's still in Aus 
in, in Auschwitz, it's just across the road from the main camp, it was part of the camp, you can still go and see that and you would never guess. You would never guess that a set of those windows had a group of Jewish women sewing to save their lives, basically. So let's talk about how this ended up happening. Use of slave labour is nothing new in Nazi Germany, but creating a fashion workshop in a death camp feels like something even like an even bigger leap. So how did it come about? Okay, so if we imagine tracking back, and this is something that the book does do, and obviously in a lot more detail, um, when you track back to see how you could establish a fashion salon in the most notorious Nazi death camp, it is less incredible than inevitable. And I hope the book makes this clear, that this is just an end process. And the genesis essentially is greed. It is rampant, revolting greed. And I'll link that in with the fashion industry. And people often underestimate clothes history, the fashion industry, um, the economics of the garment trade. But the garment trade in interwar Germany, for example, it was highly profitable and a major employer. And it is vibrant with Jewish talent and Jewish capital. So if we go back to 1933, obviously that's not the start, but we'll use that as a, a useful point. Just a few weeks after the Nazis come to power, a group of industrialists meet in Berlin and they discuss how they're going to take over Jewish textile factories and department stores, some of the most famous department stores owned and run by Jewish people. And also the things you don't think about, the wholesale warehouses and all the little shops, the fabric shops and the haberdasheries, they want to take them over the whole lot and they do it with full government support. And this group is, um, it's a consortium of industrialists and they, they're they have the acronym ADEFA. And I mentioned a dress earlier that I have from the Nazi era, and this very pretty floral apple green dress is one of ADEFA's garments. Essentially, they said, we are gonna oust all Jews from the garment trade, and we are going to produce clothes that are Aryan only. And they exhort the German people, don't buy anything from Jews, but buy things that Jews have not touched, completely Jew free. And that phrase, Judenrein, is something that, of course, the National Socialists are working to, towards in a very geographical sense. Let's make Germany Jew-free is a policy. And then let's make Europe Jew-free. So that link between the movement to genocide with the ousting of Jews from the fashion trade is really important. And it's all backed up by state-sanctioned boycotts of Jewish businesses, by individual bullying and violence and detention in, in the early concentration camps too. So we're seeing these connections all the time. Uh, Jews are stripped of assets and citizenship and this process is, is Aryanization. It, it's called um, basically Aryans, that is Caucasian non-Jews, are going to take over Jewish businesses. So you can see there's already this idea that for the privileged SS, for the privileged Nazi business people, they can take what they want from Jews, is their, is their feeling. But, and here's the other side of it, this leads to a huge shortage of skills in the fashion and garment trade. So this whole idea, we don't, we don't want Jews making our clothes, becomes, oh, we haven't got enough people making clothes now. And this is where we get the uh, implementation of forced labor factories in ghettos where Jews are corralled and brutalized. And they produce clothes for the German people with no labels on, of course. And this kind of sewing, this, this right to work for Jewish people in ghettos becomes a right to life. And so I'll bring that all now to Hedwig Huss. Hedwig is wife of Rudolf Huss, Rudolf Huss who becomes the first commandant of Auschwitz. And she's brought up her young family, she's got this growing family in Dachau, in Sachsenhausen, in, in concentration camps, where exploitation of prison labor is the norm. So when she gets to Rudolf's new posting, Auschwitz in occupied Poland, it seems perfectly natural for Hedwig to take advantage of the inmates there. Her house and all the furniture in it, the curtains in it, the food in her kitchen, the clothes in her wardrobes, they've all been stolen. So when she stands at her bedroom or attic windows and looks out over the Auschwitz main camp, which is next to her house, next to her beautiful villa and garden, she sees the rows of brick barrack blocks. 
and these barrack blocks house the first official transport of Jews to Auschwitz, which include many seamstresses. And there's the link. Hedwig in this beautiful villa thinking, I'd like seamstresses to make me lovely clothes to suit my status. Where is she going to get the workers from? Well, she starts out with local Polish women who are co-opted uh, to come and work for her in the attic, but she has to pay them. So what better way to get free clothes? It's greed. It's greed. Oh, than by using the free grim, service. isn't it? It is that grim. It is that human. It's that very basic human level. People wanting something for nothing. People exploiting their privilege. It does feel like that classic thing of people just squeezing every inch out of a, a situation just because they can. And yeah, the inhumanity of it is... Well, you'd like to think that her reaction looking out of the window at all of the brick uh, barracks would be, oh my God, this is horrific, not, what can I get out of this? Well, I mean, that's an interesting one. What did actually the SS whites know about the processes in Auschwitz? And um, when she first came to the camp, it was a prisoner of war camp and a labor camp, part of a, a big zone of interest for the SS. And it's only later, as we discover, that she discovers that is actually an extermination center. You'll have to read the book to, to find out what SS wives make of all this. Mm. And a lot of it is she actively chose to become involved in the 1920s with a, a bigoted Volkish uh, community. Volkish meaning, you know, for the German community, the German people as in not Jewish. And she actively chose to support Rudolf who actively chose work that was all part of this slave labor complex and that would ultimately bring them to Auschwitz. So it isn't just that she's passively going along. Yeah, it's like there isn't, if, if you're a pillar of humanity, you're not gonna marry that man, are you? Well, she chooses to marry someone whose views align with her own. Mm. They're part of, uh, it's something called the Ottoman Bund, the Ottoman community um, that are saying, we've got to go East and we've got to farm the East. The people there are, are not human enough to do it according to the tenets of this community we'll go out there we'll start this rural paradise and we'll we'll make germany bigger and greater again so she's got this villa that she calls paradise and she's arrived there sort of vip transfer and then what's really interesting to trace is how the lives of hedwig and all of the inmate dressmakers converge it is incredible that she did she choose to call the villa paradise yes she says i want to live here till i die wow. so let's just paradise point out that 150 that. slave laborers actually um worked on the garden to create the glass houses and the pond and the pool and the 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 pergolas the lawns the rose gardens all of it done by slaves let's start to talk about this convergence that you just mentioned what do you know, what did you find about the people who ended up involved in this workshop and how they made their way to Auschwitz? Well, that, I mean, for all the trauma, the historian in me has loved this process of detection work and discovery. And it becomes addictive as anybody who works in history knows that the more you know, the more you want to find out. So having names, meant being able to track testimonies it meant being able to interview survivors uh, their friends and so on and drawing from this we know that the majority of women who sewed for the commandant's wife for Hedwig were from Slovakia which is just across the border from Poland um, many of them are, are young women from quite poor backgrounds in fact who they were rooted from their lives in Bratislava a beautiful town or from rural towns and basically in 1942, in March and April, there are compulsory summons for young unmarried women to go and provide labor service. And I suppose technically you could say that's where they're going, but of course they're assuming these young women that it's going to be for a few weeks. And they're told if you don't show up for the transports that we will take your parents instead. So that awful threat. So, the young women are packing clothes thinking right it's cold weather we're going for hard work it's going to be a few weeks and of course they have no idea what's actually going to happen and the story of, of transport is very similar 
to the shock that many civilians had being deported via cattle cars. So already that, that process of dehumanization is, is there. They're, they're corralled first in holding camps in detention centers within Slovakia. And, and I think for a lot of the young women, this is when it hits home that this is no ordinary work placement. The, the brutal treatment there and, and the theft of their belongings starts there, but then to be shoved into cattle cars. And what struck me about the, the accounts that I, I was able to, to read was that friends cling together. So this book, although it is about horrors, it's also about the power of loyalty. And you have to imagine on this on these trains, there, there are friends. There's uh, young Irene and Renee who've been at school together. And Irene had uh, had lost her place at school because she was Jewish. And so she said, you know, I thought I'd, I thought I'd learn to sew a little bit, you know, not realizing the impact this would have. And Renee had done the same. Then there's um, uh, two sisters called Bracha and Katka. And Katka had had the call up and Bracha was well, she looked, she looked Catholic, as they called it, not Jewish. And so she was, uh, she was thinking, well, I don't need to, I don't need to go for this work summons. I can get away with perhaps going into hiding. But when she heard Katka was in a holding camp to go, she said, right, I'm going with my sister. And there are so many stories like that. So you have Irene and Rene and Bracha and Katka and Marta, and in total, about 6,000 women. And they are on the first official Jewish transports, the ones organized by Adolf Eichmann. And, and then there are other trains over the months that bring in other women. There's a very famous transport of French political prisoners, all women, who were brought into Auschwitz in January 1943. And amongst them are two dressmakers. There's Alida, who's a corsetier, arrested for distributing anti-Nazi propaganda within the layers of the corsets. And then there's Marie Lou, who is a dressmaker, but also a member of the French resistance. She's one of the, the military partisans. And then other trains coming in and, and it's fascinating to, to trace all these journeys. And my, one of my favorite, um, can I call her a character? She's a real person, is Hunya, a Slovakian dressmaker who's been working in Leipzig in Germany. And she's deported in 1943. And she's traveling again with, with a friend, they're sticking together. And as they arrive, as they arrive at the station in Auschwitz, um, at this point, it's still outside Birkenau. The husband of one of her friends turns to his wife, his wife's called Ruth, and the husband says, stick with Hunya. I have a feeling she's going to make it. And I, I really, really love that sense. Yeah, of course, you have to read the book to find out if it does. And this, this, the process of arrival, they're not actually at this stage, people aren't in, in March and April, they're not being selected for the gas chambers on arrival. They are there to work in Auschwitz. Auschwitz is a massive profit-making enterprise for the SS, but they are stripped to their clothes. So they're stripped to their clothes, their dignity. So whatever they've worn, whatever they've packed for the journey is taken from them by force. And then they are put, these early women, the early arrivals in, in 1942, are actually put in the uniforms of murdered Russian POWs. And then the later arrivals, they either get the infamous camp issue dresses, the striped dresses. Yeah. And I'm going to take a completely inappropriate diversion just to say that had no pockets in, or they're just flung this random jumble of civilian clothes and then all of it washed over, washed over by the SS guards who've got their clean tailored uniforms. And at a tidy, clean distance, you've got the SS wives in their fashions. So what a contrast. Yeah, the fact that the women creating these fashions are dressed in rags and not even allowed a pocket. Is it's not even not you know the pocket idea is like where do you put stuff you can't you can't own anything you can't keep anything yeah. and, and also as well like keep. surely as a dressmaker you need a pocket you need to check well and thread. there are lots of acts of rebellion where women started making secret little pockets that you could have worn inside your clothes called pinkly bags but that's a whole that there's a whole different story for sort of later on but it was more that sense that your clothes do matter they're not just frocks or whatever when you have your clothes taken away from you, it's it's a sartorial rape. And then you have your humanity taken away, you're naked. And then you're put in these clothes crusted with feces and blood from murdered Russians, or you're, you're flung these civilian clothes taken from other people, other deportees. 
So that that whole theatre of clothing is really deliberate from the point of view of the SS running the camp. That they're saying essentially we're superhuman. We have these extraordinary uniforms. We have warmth when we need it and boots. And you are not human because you are not wearing the right clothes. Is there not like a, a grim scenario emerging? I'm just thinking of how like everybody in Britain was gunning for a parachute to make. I mean, there's shortages. There's a war on. Is there a really grim scenario with where they get the, the fabrics to make their high end fashions from and things like that? Yeah, back in Germany, yes, civilians are really struggling to get hold of fabrics. And even things like needle and thread, thread are in huge, hugely short supply. But Auschwitz is a very different matter because the SS, even though they actually have to, to make a, a vow that they will steal nothing, yeah, they right. absolutely right, right. plunder. Down to the last cheese grater, as you've already yeah. mentioned, um, they plunder everything portable. And we also know that they plunder, they, they, they take human hair and human teeth. And so, right, the dressmaking workshop, first of all, isn't, it isn't set up straight away. It isn't that, that Hedwig says, you know, I, I'm going to I'm going to run a workshop. But she starts out right from the beginning using contacts to supply her with plunder. And this plunder is essentially all the luggage that comes from deportees and eventually it's going to be all the luggage of people who are murdered in Auschwitz and she has her contacts who sort through this this luggage to find what she needs and you talk about contamination we know that other SS wives who did the same they would use um, chemical solutions or they would put it through an extra severe washing they didn't want to catch disease from the camp as they saw it and there is a story that Hedwig had the seamstresses snip buttons off the clothes taken from Jewish people because she didn't want to, you know, you almost, you feel again, it's that physical, physical connection, isn't it? She didn't want to be doing up the buttons that had, of clothes that Jewish fingers had fiddled with, but she was still happy to wear underwear, you know, the most intimate garments. So she's taking stuff from plunder and working in these these vast warehouses that that are used for sorting and bailing up plunder much of which goes back to germany to help with civilian clothing shortages working in there are some privileged prisoners and many of them are the slovakian slovakian women from the early transports who who work in the complex of warehouses which are known as canada a land of plenty and this is a hugely preferential place to work because mm. You know, you're indoors, you're going to get beaten, but you're not working on hard labor. Some of the seamstresses start out building the gas chambers, essentially. You know, they're working in gravel pits and big brick quarries and so on. So the fabrics, the fabrics that Hedwig's going to use are taken from, from plunder. And obviously she needs people to sew them. And this is where the dressmakers come in. How did they select them? Uh, this is our... I guess it's not like the scenario where the train pulls up and they ask, what did you do? What do you do in civilian life? Um, does that come later? Or is that from the beginning how they find them? Uh, when, when, certainly when the early transports first arrive, they couldn't care less what these young girls are. I mean, they put them to entirely inappropriate work. As I say, that they're working in an industrial labour, which is absolutely not what they've trained for. What happens is... Uh, a system of connections and, and a lot of it is look and it's a woman called Marta, Marta Fuchs, a Slovakian woman who's really talented dressmaker and cutter. She had her own salon before she was deported. She's taken up as a kind of au pair at Hedwig's villa because Hedwig you know has a, a growing family and she's sort of looking after the children and doing odd jobs and there's this extraordinary scene where Hedwig is sitting on a swing sorry, not Hedwig, Marta is sitting on a swing in Hedwig's garden with the, 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 the little Hus girls around her and they're going, you can swing if you want to, you know, we're, we'll make sure you don't run away. So you have a prisoner working in the house. Anyway, Hedwig needs some work doing on for a coat, an alteration, and Marta sees her chance and says, I can do that. And so Hedwig takes Marta on to sew. And eventually Marta says, oh, you know, somebody else who could help with the sewing. And so they're working up in the attic of the Huss Villa and they start creating beautiful clothes for Hedwig. And the other SS wives get jealous. Why can't we have our own pet seamstresses? 
why can't we have all these beautiful things turn into really nice fashions? And that's why Hedvig sets up the, the fashion salon in the SS administration building just across uh, about a 10 minute walk from her from her house. And Marta is in charge. She's put in charge of this salon and she goes along to the plunder warehouses to find fabrics to make clothes for Hedwig and the other SS wives. And here she meets other Slovakian women that she knows. So she meets Irene. She's related to Irene through marriage and says, oh, yeah, Irene, uh, I definitely need another seamstress in this fashion salon. And Irene comes in. She's saved. And then Irene says, well, you, you know, I've got a friend, Bracca. I think we definitely need Bracca to come and sew here. And Bracca is saved. And then Bracca says, well, I've got a sister, Katka. She's really good at making coats. And Katka is saved. And essentially, Marta chooses women and she plucks them out of, of Birkenau, the hellhole of Birkenau. She plucks them out of industrial work. And the fashion salon becomes this extraordinary hub of resistance, saving lives of, frankly, sometimes people who have no idea how to sew. And the, the resist her resistance work is, is um, more specific than this as well. And eventually Hunya, Hunya, the, the, the very spirited woman from Leipzig, Leipzig some friends from her hometown say, oh, Honey is in Birkenau. She won't survive long there. Let's get her into this dressmaking workshop as well. So ultimately, it's an absolute lifesaver. And it's all through these extraordinary connections, the friendships and loyalty of the, the Jewish inmates. I do love that. It's got that kind of Schindler, Oscar Schindler kind of style to it, hasn't it? Turning Nazi greed kind of on itself and using it as a means of resistance. I just want to kind of dig a little deeper into that process of um, the, sort of the benefits of this. Is there a sense of relief amongst those who are, are selected? Is this purely, you know, it's, it's that you know somebody and so there's almost an expectation of loyalty? How, I mean, what kind of benefits are there to this whole thing other than not being used as, as slave labor in uh, an even more severe setting? I would say that at a very basic level, it is the difference between living and dying. If you stay in Birkenau and the conditions there, the disease there, the despair, you're, you're next door to the gas chamber complexes, you will die. It's statistical. There, I mean, as many of the dressmakers themselves said, the only way out of here is through the chimneys. And Bracker was one of the few optimists, Bracker and Hunya, who said, no, we are getting out of this. We are going home to have coffee and cake. So the contrast, it, it literally is life or death. And to come into this, the SS admin block where the, the fashion salon was, was housed, it is, I mean, Hunya, Hunya, when she arrives there, she said, it, this is a paradise. You know, what a contrast to Hedwig with her beautiful villa. But Hunya said, we have, we have real beds. We have clean bed linen. They still had the same awful starvation rations, but they were able to eat them in relative peace. They were given real clothes to wear. So Hunya arrives in rags. And in, in fact, her friends in, the, in, the, in the, the, the other Slovakian women don't recognize her. And she said, what, do you think I was going to look the same after so many months in Birkenau? And, and she, they get clothes. They have the opportunity to wash and they are doing meaningful work. And that sense that you have got a purpose. So sewing, ironically, that yes, they're sewing for their, their slave owners, if you will, but they are doing something meaningful. They are not being left to rot in the mud and filth. It's some and sense so, of agency, isn't it? So, sorry, say again? It's some sense of agency over your own existence, isn't it? Absolutely. And they, they do say that. And then you've got their, their capo, if you, that's the term for the person organising the work commando, is Marta. And unlike other capos, she is not beating them. She is, is not violent at all. She is there as this compassionate and very clever leader. Yeah. And I think when I, you can't emphasise em, enough how lucky they were. And they knew it. They knew their privilege. And so they used it. Every single one of them used whatever ounce of privilege they had to undermine the, the Nazi overlords through acts of resistance and to save other people's lives. And you think of sewing as a real soft skill in a way. Well, I don't, but some people underestimate it. But the fact that they were sewing 
gave them all these opportunities for acts of resistance and the I mean, they're, and yet they're living in this, this admin block surrounded by, there's a beauty parlor there, there's a hairdresser's, these are perks for the SS, and yet they know what's happening. They know exactly what's happening to the women who, who aren't saved. They know, they know the significance of all the plundered garments that everyone comes from, from someone who's been murdered or enslaved. And actually the, the seamstresses, they do find clothes that belong to their loved ones. So they still have that horror and that trauma of knowing that while they might be alive, their loved ones have been murdered. So although they said that they'd left hell in many ways, they, they knew everything. They suffered so much still, mm. but they were alive. I'm really interested to talk. Uh, we should talk about what kind of stuff they made, definitely. But I really want to talk about the absolute hypocrisy of not wanting to touch buttons that a Jew has used and yet being fine with showing off the clothes they've made you with all your friends. I, where does your head even, I hate this woman, I'm not gonna lie. I, I, just, I didn't even know she was, well, I knew he had a wife, but I didn't even know anything about her until we started this interview. I hate this woman. How can you, how can you live with that level of hypocrisy? But she is an ordinary woman in many ways. You know, yeah, I hate her. I yeah. hate all of the women who, who benefited from this system, who knowingly benefited from it. But it's too simple to say, oh, she's a sociopath, she's a psychopath, she's mm. evil, because she is, everything, the world she's living in is legal by Nazi standards. And she, I mean, she's really proud of the things she does to look after her little pet slaves, you know, that she actually saves Marta's life on three occasions. And she, so her and Rudolf do, you know, Rudolf Huss, and they're pleased that they look out for their, 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 their labourers. And she's absolutely looking to, to, to forget the fact that, say, out of the, the Slovakian women who've been deported, many of, um, many of them, well, most of them die. I mean, there are 10,000 Slovakian women deported in total, 200 return to Slovakia at the end of the war. So Hedwig has this little pocket of mainly Jewish seamstresses. And what's really strange is when I asked the last surviving seamstress, I said, what did you make of Hedwig, Hedwig Huss? You know, what are your feelings about her? And she sort of shrugged, this dressmaker, she shrugged and she said, she was of her time too. And I thought, I, I can't have that same response. No, like you, I'm, I'm feeling the hatred, but the, the, like you say, the hypocrisy is there, but the greed, the greed wins out. Hedvig and her friends want new frocks. The dressmakers sew beautifully. Ergo, the dressmakers make them new frocks. But how do they get their heads around? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just still struggling with the hypocrisy of it. They Good, we should be, shouldn't we? <laughs> Are they not like, I? look so it's like look what my pet jew made me but on the other hand you don't want to touch things that jewish people have touched it's just like the the way they can can i think i'm just stunned by the level to which they can compartmentalize yeah. their slave labor and the fact that they think these people are criminally inferior to them um with the fact that they brag about them making their clothes and they've got well, an amazing wardrobe because of criminally them. and racially inferior yeah. is the crucial bit there's um, a, a conversation recounted of Hedvig in the attic workshop before it's um, transferred to, to being a full salon and she's overlooking Marta's work and she just says I don't understand how you can sew so beautifully Jews are all parasites and con men that's the word she used how is it that you can sew and there's another very telling scene within the salon um, that um, the last survivor recounted to me she said that the SS woman in charge of guarding the salon a woman called Elizabeth Rupert she she leans over she leans over Hunya actually no this is Hunya's story of course Hunya she leans over Hunya and she said I had no idea Jews could work so beautifully after the war I'm going to open a fashion workshop in Berlin and you can all come and work for me and Hunya says Bulgarian <laughs> not on your life that's the polite version and the guard says what did you say and Hunya replies in German yes that'll be lovely so oh. there's that hypocrisy because there won't be an after war after the yeah, war. For you're planning to exterminate the whole race. It, 
they're not going to be are, around. They're in, under no illusions about this. The dressmakers don't have to undergo the horrifically brutal roll calls that the regular inmates do, but they have compulsory attendance at hangings. Anybody who transgresses or attempts an escape is hung. And they know they are providing clothes for the wives of men who are torturing, brutalizing and murdering on a daily basis. They know all that truth. And yet Marta is still in the fitting room of the salon, running a tape measure along Hedwig's curves and, you know, chit chatting with her about, oh, what fashion would Madame like her frock? I, I, there is no way to get your head around it. And the dressmakers themselves, they had no way of committing acts of sabotage, but one of them, one of them snapped actually, um, one of the Slovakian girls called Lulu, while Hedwig was in the fitting room with Marta and, and, and Lulu was out in the, um, the main part of the sewing room, Hedwig's son, Hans Jürgen was uh, there. I think he was about six years old at the time and he was left to be babysat by the dressmakers, these Jewish women who don't have the right to life. And yet Hedwig leaves her son with them and Lulu just picks up her tape measure and she wraps it around Hans Jürgen's neck. And she says, soon you're all going to hang your mother, your father, all of you. And she lets the boy go. And the next day Hedwig says, well, you know, my little boy doesn't want to come in for a fitting today. I can't understand what's happened to him. <laughs> and doesn't it make your head explode? Yeah. Total disconnect. It's insanity. Wow. But as part of your research, you've been mentioning you did conduct interviews with Holocaust survivors and their relatives, notably Mrs. Is it Kohut you pronounce? Mrs. Kohut, yeah. Yeah, who features at the very start of your book. We do a fair bit of oral history on History Hack, but interviewing a Holocaust survivor is on another level. How do you approach a topic like that, knowing the trauma that the person you're interviewing has been through? Yeah. Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Kohut features at the beginning and at the end of the book because I wanted to frame the story with her words, with that sense that this is real, that history is real people. And I don't actually tell you who Mrs. Cohut is. I want you to read the book and think which one of the dressmakers is she? Who survives, who doesn't? And I've got to say, I was incredibly nervous. I felt very much out of my depth. I traveled to San Francisco to meet her. And although I've interviewed a lot of women uh, from this era, from the 1940s, Many of them, you know, they'll be from women who work for Bomber Command in Blighty sort of thing. And their stories, although tinged with tragedy, they were, that was a very personal level tragedy. Whereas this, I was, I felt I was taking the weight of the Holocaust, carrying it with me. And I think really you have to go into it with compassion, of course, and respect. So I, I went armed with questions. I took fashion magazines. I took clothes because, you know, I wanted to know what did you make for Hedwig, the commandant's wife? And what you then have to do is put aside the questions you've prepared and listen to what the person actually wants to tell you. And what Mrs. Cohort wanted to talk about was her family, her family who'd been murdered. And she wanted to she wanted to make sure the world knew. She just kept saying, you have to tell them, you have to tell them. How could they do this? For her, she didn't care about the clothes, honestly. She didn't care about Hedwig Huss. She cared about her family. She was still grieving. And certainly there were questions that I had to back away from. And one of these was about the question of sexual trauma and rape in the camp which really is one of the last taboos about the Holocaust, is talking about particularly female experiences. And you could definitely see that she wanted to block that off and put it in a compartment. And definitely she and others have lived their lives with compartmentalised versions of their past. And so she focused on her family. And what came out of that, I also realised when you listen, you know, when you listen instead of asking questions, is how important the bonds of friendship they were forged before the war and in the fashion salon how important these bonds were after the war and Mrs Cohort talked a lot about how the friendships of the women who survived how they nurtured each other um, in the final months of the war when things were most desperate and and after the war as well so it was a, it was the most staggering experience of my life in in this beautiful city of San Francisco and uh, glorious sunshine, the Golden Gate Bridge. And I was just shaken in every molecule, really. But I, I've got to say, I must say that the, the families have all been phenomenal. 
they've all been so helpful to me and so welcoming and in sharing these incredibly intimate details of their family's trauma. So I'm immensely grateful for all the families who've supported me in this research. Is what they don't or they, they choose not to share with you or what they don't talk about kind of as telling? Are there sort of gaps, if you will, in the testimony where you can kind of sense that there is more for, Always. for, for, for obvious reasons they don't want to, to dwell on those? Yeah, I think, I think historians of trauma um, have to be very sensitive to that, to, to hearing what's not there and seeing what's invisible, if you will, you know, that contradiction. And I spent a lot of time after, I had a week in San Francisco, a lot of time afterwards, reviewing it, just letting it sink in, and, and also talking to people around Mrs. Kohut, her family and friends and their perspectives. So yeah, there's you need incredible sensitivity, I think. Um, and I mean, it's still ongoing for, for the generations afterwards that the, the, the children of survivors had very little, the survivors had almost no psychological support. The children of survivors, the, the second generation, learn to be able to talk about what it was like to grow up in a house with so much buried trauma. And then the third generation, the grandchildren are often the people that survivors are able to talk to. And we see that not just with Holocaust survivors, but I mean, people who've lived through the, the Second World War, they perhaps sometimes open up 50, 60 years after the event. And uh, I mean, they, they've, they've been using dressmaking and needlework as a means of survival all the way through this I mean it goes without saying it's a horrific experience is the association too traumatizing for them to ever go back to that do they forge new careers in the aftermath of the war or do they carry on as dressmakers a great question Basically, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, about how they were evacuated from Auschwitz um, on the, the death marches, as they're now called, marching through occupied Poland into, into Germany. Um, how some of them have escape attempts and there, there are uh, several of the dressmakers make escape attempts and some survive and some are shot dead. Um, others are, are sent on to Ravensbrück and Malchow, which are camps in Germany. But those who do survive, those who make it home, one of the first things they have to do is reclothe themselves so they get civilian clothes. And that is part of the rehumanization. So clothes really matter still. And they all talk about getting a sewing machine. One of the dressmakers actually goes back to her home, which has been taken over by a local who says, oh, no, no, I don't remember you living here. And she goes into the house. She's got a, a policeman with her. She goes, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine, Mav in that back. And amongst that is, amongst those things are the sewing, sewing, her sewing machine. So she starts sewing again. And one of the dressmakers, I don't want to say who, you'll have to read the book to find out. Um, she actually starts a salon up again and invites her friends and colleagues from the Auschwitz Salon to come and sew for her. Um, one of the dressmakers is in Israel working for some very prestigious um, clothing companies and all of them talk about appreciating that it was sewing that helped them survive, not as strongly as talking about it was their friendships and loyalties that helped them survive. Um, but certainly, certainly one of the women attributes, attributes her survival to having a good capo, that's that's Marta, a good leader of the, the workshop, and to being able to sew. So that, that, that thread does run through it. I actually have a suit made by one of the dressmakers, made by one of the survivors, um, which it was made post-war. To my knowledge, nothing survives of the, of the, from the workshop, or if it does, we won't know, it won't have a label on. You won't know that this was stitched in Auschwitz, but I have a suit sewn by one of the dressmakers, and although, you wouldn't know it to look at it. You know, it doesn't look anything extraordinary. It just, it, it actually makes me cry to look at it. I look at the stitches and I look at the cut of it and feel the silk. And knowing what I know of this woman, I, I do feel that sense of intense connection, intense compassion and admiration for her resilience. Absolutely. I mean, it's imbued with a far greater significance, isn't it? Because of that connection and that history behind it. 
Yeah, very, very, very much so. And, and, and all part of the legacy, something that um, the, the survivors in their testimonies or in my interview with Mrs. Cohort, they talk about that sense of people must know, we must still keep telling people. And I think this is one reason the families have supported my work on the book so much is that not only do they want this, this tribute to their, the, the quiet heroism of their female relatives, but they also think it's still important for new generations to understand. And hopefully this, this way of looking at it through clothes, through sewing, through this, this grotesque fashion salon anomaly, hopefully it will bring new, it will, it will gain new readership. It will perhaps open people's eyes a lot more and help them think in a fresh way about it. About I think the it absolutely will. I mean, I, I was very lucky to see the, the preprint version um, to prep this interview and it's a brilliantly written book uh, it's very kind of very readable in a sense that it's very easy to make a topic like this quite difficult to read um, but this is this is your book is very good at finding that balance between making people reflect honestly about the these ladies experiences and at the same time not kind of shying away from anything so I, I think it's a fantastic book folks the dressmakers of Auschwitz go and buy it Lucy thank you so much for joining us this has been fascinating and thought-provoking and kind of as harrowing as we perhaps expected it to be but I've, I've really enjoyed the experience thank you thank you for, it's been it's been a privilege to work on this project and it is an absolute pleasure to be able to share the stories of these women with a wider audience when our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 